Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Moorhead. I'm from the law faculty. I'm just here to chair today's uh, lunch hour lecture. It's my great pleasure to introduce my um, colleague, Philip Sands QC, Professor Philip Sands QC. One of the great things about working at UCL is great and also slightly humiliating is some of your colleagues are exceptional, exceptionally talented in more than one sphere of activity. For those of you who don't know, Philip's a practicing lawyer, very, very well-known advocate and uh, a renowned academic and also um, something of a, um, a, a political activist, I suppose. And indeed has just um, had his, his first feature film produced. I feel sick with <laughs> envy. Um, uh, so uh, without more ado, I'll hand over to Philippe. What the, the kind of structure of these is we have to get out by 5-2 um, on pain of death. Philippe has tr uh, will try and limit his talk to about half an hour to leave about 10 minutes for questions. So there should be time for questions at the end. Philippe, over to you. Great. Richard, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to speak today about uh, the fine mess we seem to have got ourselves into uh, in relation to the state of international law, and in particular, the question of the United Kingdom's engagement with international law. And I'm going to tell a little bit of a story uh, and ask the question, where are, we, uh, where are we heading and what have we uh, become? Uh, I noticed that as Richard uh, mentioned the film, a couple of people I heard said, what's it called? It is related in part to this story, I suppose, because it deals with the events um, of the Nuremberg trial, 1945 and 1946, and in particular, my personal relationship and friendship with the sons of two very senior Nazis, extremely senior Nazis. One was hanged in the great Nuremberg, the famous Nuremberg trial, Hans Frank uh, and his son Nicholas. The film is called My Nazi Legacy, What Our Fathers Did, uh, and it opens in cinemas, astonishingly, uh, on the 20th of November, which is exactly the 70th anniversary of the opening day of the Nuremberg trial. That is coincidental, but a happy coincidence. At around that time in 1945, there was a great change uh, in the international legal order in which the United Kingdom played a very significant role, and that was the adoption uh, of the United Nations Charter, uh, which for the first time outlawed as a matter of general international law the use of military force as an instrument of international policy by individual states. Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter, as many of you in this room know, prohibited the use of force, but left open two exceptions. One exception was the right of use to use force in self-defense. I'll come on and say a little bit more about that uh, in due course. And the other was the right to use force where the Security Council had authorized its use. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, also. There is, of course, emerging, and I'd say no more uh, th than that it is emerging, the idea that a state could use force in order to protect fundamental human rights in certain circumstances. That's controversial because it is open to uh, abuse. Uh, that does not mean it is non-existent or existent. It's in sort of statu nascendi. It's emerging into being and into consciousness. Um, but, but essentially, the position in international law uh, is transformative uh, as of 1945, the year uh, in which this story essentially starts. Warts and all, the United Kingdom has played a very central role in the promotion of the obligations under the United Nations Charter. I'm not starry-eyed about the United Kingdom's historical record in certain matters, including in particular in relation to colonialism and the legacy of colonialism. But in this, the 800th year uh, anniversary of Magna Carta, there is a certain sense in which, certainly by a comparative record, one could conclude that the United Kingdom in terms of a commitment to follow international law in international relations has probably been as good as anyone else and certainly as good as any of the other uh, P5 permanent members uh, of the Security Council. That is not to say it is perfect or unblemished. I want to be very clear uh, in what uh, 
uh, I am saying. I would say also that in recent years, the United Kingdom has had an important role in the development of human rights law and in the emergence of a human rights culture based on the rule of law internally in the United Kingdom. I think we're reaching a point where we may be, we're entitled to ask ourselves the question, are we on the cusp of a very significant change of direction? Part of that question is to be addressed by reference to the debate that's going on domestically in relation to two matters. Firstly, the question of the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union, which will be very much part of a domestic political debate over the next year and a half uh, in the run-up to a referendum which will almost certainly take place in 2017 and not any earlier. And simultaneously with that, distinct but related, the question of the United Kingdom's engagement with the European Convention on Human Rights. The stalking horse issue for that is the government's commitment to repeal uh, the Human Rights Act. And the big question is with what? And some of you will have read the op-ed I wrote in The Guardian uh, last week, in which I explained my own perception, having served on the government's commission on a Bill of Rights. There are certainly a number of people in the government and on the conservative benches who see replacement of a Human Rights Act with a so-called British Bill of Rights as a way of withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights. And in June this year, when asked explicitly whether he would rule out um, withdrawal from the European Convention on the Human Rights, uh, the Prime Minister declined to do so very explicitly. That, I thought, was a dark day uh, for this country, given the role that it has played and the signal it sends to others who have a uh, less strong, shall we say, uh, commitment to the protection of human rights at the domestic level. So the context right now is of a government that seems to be, shall we say, loosening the bonds of constraint with international obligations. And the question is, where is that leading to? That's a big question, and I can't answer it in its totality, so I want to focus on the use of force and tell the story uh, that has happened. I think, uh, since Iraq, I think we are in a uh, very difficult situation uh, and on the edge of uh, a potentially even more difficult situation. But someone else talking. It did, it was very exciting. Someone else was... 2003, many of you are well aware of. The United Kingdom joined the United States and a small group of other countries in uh, using force uh, to remove Saddam Hussein from office uh, in circumstances which, to put it at its highest, uh, was of dubious uh, legality. The argument made by the United Kingdom was that the use of force against Iraq uh, had been justified by Security Council Resolution 1441, which had offered Iraq one last opportunity uh, to disarm. Uh, there was no further resolution. I think the great preponderance uh, of view in the academic community and amongst governments, overwhelming I would say now, uh, is that the use of force in 2003 uh, was unlawful. That, of course, was not the least uh, of the difficulties and uh, you will have read, not for the first time, on Sunday that the former Prime Minister, Mr. Blair, issued a sort of partial apology uh, for uh, what had happened, not in relation to uh, the legality uh, or the circumstances of the decision uh, to use force, but the lack of uh, planning. Um, that move in 2003, of course, had very significant international consequences, but I think it also had very significant domestic consequences. Uh, I remember going with my wife and my young, then young children on the uh, march uh, in February uh, 2003 and seeing uh, placards uh, being waved in relation to Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter and in, in very, very large numbers. I think for anyone who teaches international law, who's an academic and who sees a million or more people uh, on the march with vast numbers of placards essentially saying, let's follow international law, 
is a significant uh, moment. I think the United Kingdom has never really recovered from what happened uh, in 2003, and I think it will probably come to be seen as uh, a moment of very great change in terms of Britain's place in the world. Uh, I think beyond the question of uh, legality uh, is the question of consequence, and I think it's now fairly clear that there is some sort of a relationship uh, between what happened in uh, March 2003 and the emergence of ISIS and the very fundamental challenge that that now poses. One only has to look at the identity of the military uh, leaders who are running ISIS and see their very close connection uh, to the community of uh, Saddam-era generals who were involved uh, in Iraq. And that is beginning to come up the agenda. So that was the first step of a most unfortunate um, direction. Uh, as you know, six years later, it took six years, um, the uh, new then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, successor to Mr. Blair, um, established the Chilcot Inquiry, uh, which was supposed to report on all of this. That is now more than six years ago, and I think uh, we are on the cusp of being in a situation in which it has taken longer for the inquiry to report than the period of time that passed between the conflict being initiated and the inquiry being set up, which I think is all one needs to say, really, in terms of that extremely unfortunate situation. I, I don't know exactly, of course, what the inquiry is going to say, um, and one has to keep an open mind. It may surprise us. But one area that it will not address is the issue of legality. And this is by decision. Uh, it seems very clear, I'm not certain, but I'll put it pretty high, uh, that there will be nothing in the inquiry report on the question of the legality of the war. The inquiry was staffed by five uh, members, or has five members. None of them have any background in the area of uh, public international law in a real and material sense. Um, and they took a decision, and it was their decision, not anyone else's decision, not to assist themselves with what is normally done inquiries of this kind, to have what is called a counsel to the inquiry appointed, a barrister who would take responsibility, a senior barrister, who would take responsibility for sifting through the evidence, for preparing questions, and so on and so forth. They've retained an advisor on international uh, law, uh, but for, I gather, a very uh, limited function. Now, one of the curiosities uh, of Chilcot uh, is that uh, it uh, put out a call for submissions on the legal issues associated with the war in 2003. And I was amongst the 30 or so individuals who made a written submission to that. I think it is absolutely deplorable that those written submissions have not been made public. That was more than four years ago. I don't remember the exact date, uh, but they have uh, remained hidden in the recesses. I have seen some of those submissions uh, made by former government legal advisors, made by extremely senior and serious individuals. My sense is, but of course I don't know the detail, is that by an overwhelming margin, the submissions make clear that the war in Iraq was not pursued by the United Kingdom government in compliance with the obligations that I set out at the beginning <coughs> in relation to the United Nations uh, Charter. That, however, uh, will not apparently be addressed in the Chilcot report. Uh, I have picked that up. Uh, from speaking to a number of people uh, who have been witnesses uh, in the report and who have received the so-called Maxwellization letters, which make it rather clear that there will be nothing in the report that expresses a view one way or the other on legality. Claire Short made a public intervention uh, in which she bemoaned that fact because it seemed she was going to be criticized as Minister for International Development on inadequate planning and preparation for the consequences of the war. 
and she made the point that I think is a perfectly reasonable point, how can you be criticized for the conduct of a war when you do not know what the scope of the conflict is going to be and whether its scope meets legal obligations. In other words, Chilcot appears to have decoupled the question of the legality of the war that was waged with the question of the legality or illegality of the consequences, or at least uh, poor planning, of the consequences of the war. One of the merits of focusing on international law is that it helps to define the scope of the operations that are going to follow in terms of principles of proportionality uh, and the extent to which the conflict can and cannot take a particular direction. And it seems to me, if that is what has happened, uh, there will have been a missed opportunity in the Chilcot report to explore the relationship between the legality of the conflict in the first place and the adequacy of the planning that then followed, or uh, as many would put it, I think, the inadequacy of the planning that then uh, followed. So, uh, again, uh, having uh, fallen into error in, and illegality in 2003, the opportunity to learn the lessons of that error and illegality in 2003 are being missed. And that, I think, uh, is regrettable and compounds the messy situation in which we now find ourselves. We then fast forward to 2013, uh, when the issue came up for the first time in Parliament uh, about the use of force in Syria. Um, and the matter was, I think rather surprisingly for many, very courageously in the eyes probably of even more, uh, one that was voted down by the House of Commons. The Prime Minister, Mr. Cameron, wanted to be able to use force in Syria and the House of Commons declined to provide authorization for that use of force. Now, there's an important distinction here, which I just want to explain momentarily, between Iraq and Syria. The United Kingdom has joined in the use of force in relation to <coughs> Iraq. It is able to do so because there is a lawful and recognized government in Iraq that has requested the assistance of certain countries, including the United Kingdom, to assist it in defending itself against ISIS. So whatever you think about the merits of the decision of use of force in Iraq, it is, in my view, plainly not unlawful for the United Kingdom to assist a lawful government in Iraq which has made a valid request uh, to do it. The situation in Syria is different because the United Kingdom does not recognize the Assad regime as being a government anymore that can make a lawful uh, request, uh, and it has not received a request for assistance that it is willing to uh, accede to. And so the question of legality or illegality of the use of force in Syria in the summer of 2013 was, I think, rather plain in the direction of uh, a conclusion that you could not lawfully use force uh, in uh, Syria, but you could in relation to uh, Iraq. I have to accept that the distinction seems an odd one in circumstances in which national boundaries have broken down and in which Islamic State now runs a purported caliphate that straddles the border. It does seem sort of counterintuitive that you can use force on one side of the border but not on the other side of the border. And I think that is a reasonable critique and it's worth thinking about. But as matters stand under international law, those boundaries between Iraq and Syria still exist and still are recognized as the lawful boundaries and they have to be respected as a matter of uh, international uh, law. We then fast forward uh, a couple more years and we come to a situation in which uh, on the very day that the government uh, of our, our government does a U-turn on the influx of Syrian refugees, in my view a wholly inadequate U-turn because it simply does not go 
uh, far enough. Uh, we note that over the past uh, decade or so, um, Germany has not bombed anybody uh, in Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or Iraq and is taking one and a half million refugees. We have bombed uh, all of those countries, it now turns out, and were willing to take none, uh, but have now apt it to the glorious figure of 20,000. It is pitiful and it is disgraceful when you participate in those kinds of activities over an extended period of time, you're going to cause a huge amount of human mayhem and we have a responsibility as a society to take responsibility and ownership of the mayhem that we have caused. And we are not willing to do that as a country and, or as a government and that is, I think, seriously uh, problematic. But on that same day, the Prime Minister slipped into uh, Parliament and the House of Commons a uh, response uh, to a question to announce that the United Kingdom had, for the first time ever, adopted a policy of killing its own nationals. Uh, and that two British nationals alleged to be uh, ISIS uh, activists uh, had been killed by drone attack uh, in Syria. The justification for that was not uh, that it had been authorized uh, by the Security Council, not that it could be justified by means of self-defense, uh, but by means uh, of protection of fundamental human rights, but in the self-defense of the United Kingdom. Uh, I have to say a pretty implausible claim, because in order to make that argument, you'd have to show that those two individuals were uh, imminently about to attack the United Kingdom, even if they, ha if, if they had not uh, already done so. So I think the facts, such as they are in the public domain, don't really point to much of a compelling argument uh, of self-defense of the United Kingdom. I put in the caveat that I don't know all of the facts. I don't know what other information uh, is out there that is available uh, to the government and the intelligence services. But on the uh, uh, evidence of what is publicly available, it looks, frankly, pretty hopeless. Interestingly, a week later, uh, a tidbit of information emerged which seemed to confirm that the government was itself rather sceptical about uh, that argument. In the formal letter you are required to put to the Security Council when you exercise the right of self-defense, the United Kingdom actually gave that reason and another reason to justify uh, the killing of two UK nationals, and that was that it was done uh, in the context of the lawful exercise of collective self-defense uh, supporting Iraq against attacks from those uh, individuals. So it's an alternative argument that is put that tends to underscore uh, the force uh, of uh, the first uh, argument. It, it doesn't seem to me, again, on the facts that it is any more uh, persuasive or effective. Tying the strands together, I, I think one could discern a sort of fraying commitment to the fundamentals of international law as adopted in 1945. And that brings me essentially to my uh, concluding uh, topic, and that is what has happened in the past week, uh, which uh, some of you will be aware of, um, which has been described both as surprising, shocking, deplorable. And that is the change that was effected last Thursday to the Ministerial Code of Conduct. The Ministerial Code of Conduct is the text which uh, informs the responsibilities of ministers of Her Majesty's government in making decisions in relation to anything in which they exercise their lawful uh, public uh, responsibilities. And the um, Ministerial Code, which was last issued in 2010, uh, and which simply repeated in these terms a code which had long existed, was changed in a material sense. The Ministerial Code of 2010 and in the periods before provided, and I quote, that ministers had an overarching duty to comply with the law including international law and treaty obligations 
and to uphold the administration of justice and to protect the integrity of public life. The commitment to comply with law remains, but the words including international law and treaty <coughs> obligations have gone. And that, I think, marks a most serious departure from a very long-standing commitment. It is the logical consequence of all that has come before. It is impossible, I think, to escape the sense, they haven't articulated as a government what were the formalized reasons for making that change. It's impossible to escape the conclusion that the code has been changed precisely to ease the task of engaging in these kinds of adventures, whether it is the waging of full-scale war or uh, the uh, operation of drones in places like uh, Syria. It is a retreat from the position that the United Kingdom has always taken. It's a retreat of which the Attorney General was apparently unaware. On the very day that the code was changed, he gave a speech, as reported in the Guardian newspaper, which quoted the words I've just uh, underscored as having been removed as being part of the code. Uh, in my uh, view, his position now approaches uh, the position of being completely untenable. If he does not effect uh, a uh, change to restore what came before, I really do think he should consider uh, his uh, position which is already, I think, uh, in a somewhat precarious situation. I noticed uh, that when he appeared before the uh, House Commons Select Committee on Justice and asked about the use of drones uh, in Syria, one of the lines he used uh, was that he agreed, uh, he had read what the Prime Minister had said about the matter and he agreed with everything the Prime Minister had said. That is an inversion of the normal way of conducting business. It is for the Prime Minister to get an opinion from the attorney and to comply with what the attorney says and reach agreement with what the attorney says, not the other way round. And so the formulation, I think, was rather indicative. Um, his presence as Attorney General, of course, uh, arises from the fact that the previous incumbent of the office, Dominic Grieve, uh, MP, uh, was removed from office, sacked, uh, because he was not willing to go along with the government's position on the European Convention on Human Rights and was not willing to countenance any situation uh, in which the possibility of withdrawal could be imagined. And so you see a change that has taken place in the position of the principal legal advisor uh, to the government, uh, now someone who has no track record at all, literally no track record uh, in supporting uh, in dealing with issues of international law uh, or the United Kingdom's <coughs> compliance with obligations uh, under international law, uh, taking office and at the same time finding um, uh, that he is apparently um, so, so pushed push to one side uh, as the ministerial code is affected. Uh, the position is taken formally by the government while it still says we have an overarching obligation to comply with the law, but of course, as you know, in, in English law, international law is not part of the law unless it has been formally incorporated into domestic law. And so the change is very significant in terms of the practicalities, for example, of unincorporated instruments being taken into account or rules of customary international law being taken into account. And one can quite imagine now a scenario in which, for example, if the United Kingdom were to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, it would now be said there is no obligation anymore to take into account those obligations, or if a lesser position were to be taken, uh, which decoupled, for example, judgments of the European Court of Human Rights with English law, the obligation in the Human Rights Act to take account of judgments uh, of the European Court of Human Rights being removed, then under the ministerial code, there would be no mechanism for uh, judgments of the European Court of Human Rights to be taken into account by ministers in complying with their obligations because they would be only obligations under international law, not under domestic law. And I think it's a first principle of interpretation that if you've got a text 
which refers exclusively to law, including international law and treaty obligations. And then you replace it with another text that says only law. The desire is, I think, reasonably to be concluded, to exclude from that process of deliberation obligations under international law. So it is an extremely unhappy period in which I stand before you. I think it's impossible to avoid the conclusion that the United Kingdom uh, is taking a path in which its uh, relationship with matters of international law and treaty law uh, is being weakened uh, and in some cases broken altogether. And I think that raises some very, very fundamental questions about the nature of this country today and the direction that it is taking and its commitment to the rule of law at the international level. Let me stop there and let's throw it open for questions and reactions on anything that you want to talk about. You, you, thank you. Okay, so we have a question there and then perhaps get ready to do the next one there. So this gentleman here, I, I was sitting um, oh, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I just wondered if you could comment on what your opinion is on the whole mechanism of the Chilcot inquiry itself, because it's, it's always struck me as rather naive to expect that a body can come along and tell us what's right and wrong, and it's headed by a particular gentleman who's supposed to represent some kind of wisdom, and now we're saying why is he taking... But what, what could the Chilcot inquiry have told us which we couldn't have found out by other means? I mean, what was... What's the whole point of the Chilcot Inquiry? Well, well the, the point of the Chilcot Inquiry is to get to the truth of, of what happened and from that draw lessons to avoid us making mistakes in the future. And, of course, one of the tragedies is that it having taken so long um, to report, we have no formal report on which the lessons learned in 2003 can be taken into account in 2015 as we proceed today in Iraq and Syria and other parts of the world. So that was the basic idea. And on that um, basis, it has failed already. Whatever it says doesn't matter because the lessons learned aren't being taken into account and one fears that the same mistakes uh, are being made again, a sort of short-termism that's not looking to the long-term unintended consequences. Actually, a lot of people said, in November 2002, you remove Saddam, you remove the Sunnis from power, you leave a vacuum, this is what is going to happen. And that was predicted, and Chilcot, if he's worth anything, will report on that. It's the, it's the British way of doing things. You sort of have a problem, you kick it into the long grass, you hope that people forget about it. This one, people have not forgotten about it. I think the difficulty for the inquiry uh, is that it has been staffed in part with people who are simply not up to the job. Um, and there are a couple of individuals on it, judging by the public questioning, who are very much up to the job, but there are others who are not. I have very low expectations. I hope I'm completely wrong, and I, I'm shown to be completely wrong. I will be totally uh, d delighted. But it's the usual British way uh, of doing it, except that, as with other inquiries, they did not appoint a council. And that meant that when you're dealing with literally hundreds of thousands of pages of evidence, Without a person trained to sift through that evidence, you're going to find yourself in difficulties. You can say a lot of bad things about lawyers, but one thing lawyers know how to do is take a mass of documents and work out what's important, what's not important, and see through to the essential important text. Just a small uh, question of information. You mentioned the current Attorney General, but you didn't remind us of his name or her name. Who is it? Do you know Anyone what? there? Uh, do you know what? I'm guess <laughs> this is actually really embarrassing. I, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. You, I can't even remember <laughs> his name. Right. Um, he is not someone that any of us had come across before. He's not someone who has... Uh, is known, for example, to the judges because he's not uh, someone who's pleaded uh, before the higher courts. It's, it has been one of the great offices in, in the country. You, you've got a steady stream of uh, individuals who are amongst the most senior and renowned lawyers in the land. You can agree or disagree with them on various points, but there's never been any question that they are people who come to the office 
uh, with great authority and more importantly, with very great experience. Mm. This particular individual, who I'm sure is a very fine person, uh, <laughs> has uh, neither authority nor experience, which means, as I know from my own work with governments, I work a lot with foreign governments, when a prime minister says to you, or a president, the right honorable Jeremy Wright. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, shame on him. And I hope there'll be a million people on the streets to protest on this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question here. We got the microphone here to say. And then back. Uh, yes, on the subject of those um, two young men who were assassinated by drones, um, they joined a self-styled state which has actually declared war on this state. They've torn up their British passports and they have taken up arms against us. They would actually like to assassinate all of us. Does this not make them traitors? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, 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 fact, the point is, I don't know exactly all of the facts. We always learn to be a little bit careful as to what governments tell us are the facts, and we certainly treat with caution what the newspapers say are the facts. The facts don't look good in relation to these two individuals. Let's assume the facts are as bad as some people say they are. Let's proceed on that basis. What then? Is it right that the United Kingdom should now be adopting a policy of assassination of its own citizens because of allegations that they are engaged in wrongdoing against but they, the But they have hang on, hang on. said they're not hang citizens. On. Hang on, but they are, they are still citizens of the United States. <laughs> um, in such circumstances, what is to be done? Well, the first thing that has to be done is you have to follow the law in, in reacting. There are circumstances in which the law would allow in self-defense, the killing of individuals, including your own nationals, individuals who pose an imminent threat because they are about to attack the country with force or have attacked the country with force. That was the significant rule that was adopted in 1945. There is no evidence that they have attacked the country with force. There is no evidence they were about to attack the country with force. And the difficulty with the position you're putting is that if you open that door, it becomes fair game when an allegation is made that X or Y or Z is threatening to do something, you just take them out, you just kill them. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is that the country you want to become? I'm very informed, just to conclude on this important question, question by uh, an American diplomat long ago American diplomat called George Kennan, who was, the, who was a young State Department diplomat, you probably have come across his writings, yes. in Moscow in 1947, who wrote a famous anonymous telex back to Washington about the threat posed by the Soviet Union. And he ended that telex with the line, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's to this effect, the greatest threat we face is that we will become like those who seek to do us harm. And I think it's a moment to just recall what are our fundamental values. And the problem of operating as we appear to be moving towards operating is that we become indistinguishable from those, or we risk becoming indistinguishable from those who seek to do us home and harm. And I think we have to keep our, our eye on the fundamentals of our value system, which includes the rule of law, respect for the individual. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.